I, I watched uh, watched the Mandalorian trailer, and yeah, that was awesome. Like that's finally like it looks like Star Wars. As soon as I saw the Twilight, I was like, finally, <laughs> we have Star Wars aliens in Star Wars. <laughs> it only took and the, um, it only took four movies the, uh, other uh, than Rogue riding One. Riding a lizard. Yeah, I was like, oh yeah, this looks like Star Wars. Finally, it only took four yeah. movies. Well, like Rogue One had had some. Rogue One was good for that. <laughs> I was just uh, watching the trailer in the first twenty seconds. I was like, man, this has more world world building than the the first two sequel trilogy movies in twenty second trailer. So that should be fun. Made me actually like want to get Disney Plus. I was like, okay, that makes me want to get it at least for a while. And then obviously Obi Wan. Excited about that because of Ewan McGregor. I think. I think the Mandalorian and Obi Wan was a good, good buzz. Well, they're definitely needing to uh, increase their hype. Yeah. If they're going to release this new streaming platform, yeah, because because obviously they've invested a lot into setting that up. Well, and it's so, um, you know the attendance in all their parks is down, and things that you know you had Endgame, so you're gonna have like they're not obviously hurting financially like. They did well, but that ended, and then you know, oh, and they also lost uh, Spider Man. So there was like that's gonna. That, I thought that was really interesting, and I, I'm actually glad they lost Spider Man because I think it's what both funny and like I mean, it'd be interesting to see what you do now without your probably biggest character left, um, biggest character traditionally comics wise, like the most recognizable character to mass market. Spider Man's now gone. So there's like a bunch of stuff and they needed to get like that buzz because I think that is the next revenue stream, big revenue stream for them that they're banking on. So I think they did a good job with the, with the Star Wars stuff outside of, oh, did you see the poster episode nine? Yeah, I did. What did you think of it? Um, I thought the having the lightsabers out was a good move. Yes. That part was cool. Classic Star Wars with the red and blue clashing and the sort of like lightning bolts explosions yeah. coming out of it that half is cool um, the bottom half yeah having the emperor looming over top just looks a little bit cartoony yeah that's the slightly thing. desperate in that they did that reveal that the emperor was coming back i don't even have a problem with the emperor being there like i like the concept the concept's good but it looks straight out of the clone wars like it looks like yeah. a render of the clone wars i'm like that looks that looks ridiculous and that shouldn't be happening on something that you, you need to build hype for and it looks like so i saw someone is like oh it looks like they photoshopped in a toy so they found the exact like it was like a replica and it was a toy and i was like you guys you can't cheap out on We're like what are you doing you can't <laughs> what are you doing You're using a toy, toy and photoshopping in there I mean, what happened to um so i think I think Lucas's movies, maybe Spielberg's, I don't, I don't know what, which one was last, like maybe Indiana Jones, but they were the ones that last used that really famous artist that did all the old Star Wars posters and Indiana Jones posters. Right. And that's what they used Drew, to look like. Drew Struzan. Yeah. That looks really good. And you could have done that, you could have painted that and made it look really epic. Uh, and now you have a bunch of people on there. Like, you can't do that in this day and age. You can't half-assed a photoshop person like nine-year-olds can make a better like good photoshop stuff like people know how to do it it's it's not a magic trick but get a good artist on there and you and people are like oh that's cool because it's a good concept i like the i actually like the layout I, I don't mind the emperor being in there don't be afraid of it it's fine but don't make it look like a cartoon because <laughs> it's like is this an episode of rebels that are watching so i was disappointed in that i was like what the hell like this what it's a good on a graphic novel I'm, maybe but it's a little sad that even the emperor's return couldn't have been saved as a surprise um well i, I think... guess these well maybe what uh ryan johnson was trying to do and that they've once again done an about face with jj coming back yeah is the over-reliance on nostalgia to try to get Star Wars fans to come out and see this. Even um, even with the prequels, 
uh, in the early 2000s. The nostalgia was there, but I, I wouldn't say it was over relying on no, nostalgia. No, not at all. Because there was tons of new aliens, uh, new planets, and, and new things being brought in. I Purple think, lightsabers, yeah. and like just stuff you'd never seen before. I think that was probably the main complaint. I think if you would have did a little bit, a little bit more nostalgia, a lot of the prequel haters wouldn't have hated it so much. Like he almost went maybe the opposite, and that's. Uh, apparently why George Lucas, who he said that he stepped away from, he didn't really want to be in a consultant because he would have wanted to take over, but ultimately it was that they wanted to do a nostalgia film for like Force Awakens. And he's like, no, that's not, that's not the right way to go. I don't want to be any part of that because he's not interested in just redoing the old stuff. So, um, yeah, I think he was not interested in doing it in the, First of all, I actually respected it a lot. Like, uh, you know, like he said that in the prequels, he didn't do, um, when you go to hyperspace, he didn't do the the stars streaking past them from the cockpit. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, I wanted to leave the original trilogy as special. Like, that's a special thing, so I want to not touch certain things. And, uh, yeah, that's, I think that's part of it. You don't want to just do nostalgia because you want that trilogy to be special and you want the prequel trilogy to stand out despite what people kind of bitch and moan about it did definitely stand out maybe for a lot of people it stood out too much i think that was a big problem with it for a lot of people for me i, lo I love that part and it's one reason why i'm not happy with the sequel trilogy because it's just too much nostalgia like you were saying or too much repetition maybe yeah as far as the emperor I don't really have any problem with them coming back, except for the timing now. Like they're gonna, they sat here and be like, "Oh, it's the plan all along." It was like it wasn't. You didn't, you didn't hint at it at all. <laughs> like don't try and, don't try and force us to believe that. Like maybe you did have a plan. If you did, you had, you did it horribly, for seeding it, right? Everything in here is gonna seem like it's like we're we're just course correcting because of the fan backlash or whatever um yeah. which you did with the force awakens because you tried to do the opposite of what the prequels were doing and it was a clear fan you're trying to like you can't do it that way you can't constantly react to what the fans are doing just have a story that you think is worth to tell and then tell it the sequel trilogy is like you just ruined a whole bunch of like i mean last jedi took place like a day after the Force Awakens, well, you you can't tell stories in between the Force Awakens and the Last Jedi now. How on earth are you running a multi-billion-dollar corporation with Star Wars, where you always had comics and games and things to explore in between, and books in be maybe do a TV show in between the years between episodes and that kind of stuff? Like I don't know. Um, but for the Emperor, I don't have a problem with it because you need if you're gonna try and I don't know. It's at least could be interesting if they do something. Now, the most interesting thing is like the leaked footage they showed of um, Ray. Apparently, there's a shot with Ray in dark robes with a double bladed red lightsaber. I don't know if you heard that. No, I haven't heard or seen that. Yeah, I, I haven't seen any the leaked footage. I don't know if there is any. I'm sure there's some online somewhere, but um, I'm like. I don't like it because you know it's not gonna have, they don't have the balls to make her turn evil and I think it would be the only interesting thing to do with that character because she's just not very interesting as a, as a character um, and Ryan Johnson kind of took anything that was interesting away from her your parents are nobody well, why would she care she knows who her parents are <laughs> don't really understand the point of that character but if you made, made her dark because that's a whole the whole six movies beforehand were like, oh, the quick and easy path is the path of the dark side, right? Well, she's had it quick and easy. She doesn't have to train anything. She just learns her powers. So it would be the most interesting, logical thing to take her and end it dark. But they'll never do that. So I know it's just some stupid vision, like, if you choose this path, you will become... And you're like, uh, cool. Anyways, we're getting into a Star Wars right here. I didn't want to do that for 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I thought, yeah, I think 
what we wanted to talk about was niche, you know, and I was opening up with that because of Disney Plus and things like Mandalorian and things like you had like a uh, Miss Marvel show announced, you had a She Hulk show announced. So we mentioned it a little bit last up week and we've kind of talked about it in a few podcasts but like um going away from like mass market stuff to more niche market stuff and i guess leaning more towards like someone like myself or like you if we're creating something is it better to go into a niche market or go or, or wide or what's just happening with the markets overall um and it started with with that because like how hard it is to make a mass market movie with tons of appeal in this day and age um you're gonna piss off half the half the fans or half the fans are gonna like it um it just anyways i don't know how to segue off of that <laughs> but uh anyways let's just open the show um i'm old ken with me as always is the famous jmc hey everyone and uh yeah we're gonna talk about niche markets as opposed to the old school way of marketing um, or the old, old way of doing stories. What what is your take on, I guess, the state of things? Of like, what 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 do you think of as you think of niche markets? Um, I think my first uh, sort of exposure to it is probably uh, self publishing, people doing Kindle books, so that they can uh, they can make their stuff without any sort of editorial or publishing interference. They can put their words directly to the internet at large. Right. And many of them will find a market. So you don't have to sell 100,000 books uh, to be able to start to make a living at writing. Um, And you've got this platform where you can do, if you can learn how to do all the formatting uh, create a cover, right. maybe get your mom to edit it, or like, <laughs> you know whatever people are are doing to try to keep the cost down and to keep the interaction with sort of corporations at a minimum, and then um, and then your stuff is out there. So so that was my probably my first or most obvious exposure. Right. And it it's a paradigm that had already existed in the hard copy medium. But obviously printing hard copies of of books could be really expensive. And then you've got this inventory that if your book didn't take off and find a market, you have boxes full of books. Same thing with musicians that were self-releasing CDs and stuff. I mean, every musician has got a box of 500 unsold CDs in their basement. Yeah. Um, And now that it's digital, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to cost you anything because because I haven't bought a CD in oh, yeah. at least five years, so but I have downloaded music. Yeah, and I have uh, I don't I don't use um, any of the most popular streaming platforms. Um, but you know, every time I click into YouTube or whatever, and I'm watching an ad, and I know the artist is getting some revenue from it, and then it gives you, as a consumer, a bit more flexible income to also go to live gigs or go to book signings and um then you get a chance to meet the artist face to face as well which is a plus yeah so there's a couple of angles of where i'm coming at this from um obviously the main angle is uh for us is like I, i'm an independent artist and i want to remain independent so it's potentially unbiased but it, I'm usually pretty good at like kind of seeing where the overall trend of stuff is going. And I really think that niche markets are, are, are the, I guess a trend, a trend of seeing that I think big corporations are realizing we can't do, we can't do the same model over anymore. The internet is too big. People are cutting off the TV doing this so uh you had kind of non-traditional mediums like youtube and like streaming service like you were talking about uh, people doing this direct market and what big corporations want is like why are we giving up chunks of money to these people and they're saying like 
oh, people are doing fan fiction and their fan art and they're getting all these communities online and people are getting money paid directly. The corporations are... I'm just seeing right now that they're starting to realize that. So that's why you're starting to see kind of there's so much ad on YouTube, but they're going to start, you know, they're starting to like creep in there and be like, hey, why are you promoting? Like, let's make it harder for new people to get noticed. Um, All social media, that kind of thing. So you're seeing that I'm seeing that trend and I'm like, you have to always ask yourself, well, why are they doing that? It's not it's not just to be like it's not primarily to screw over people, but it's like we want to control where the money goes like we're losing tv and ad revenue we're losing kind of the main media but we saw this trend that other people have started and became you know some of them became rich off of it well we want to control that not in a like i'm an evil overlord thing we're just like hey we we're the media like we want to we want to let's get in on that um and so i see a little bit of um, a possibility that this is the last little vestige of possibly the last little vestige of independent artists being able to do that because one of the big switches is like Disney Plus and all these big companies going over to the, the streaming service. And we touched on this a little bit before, where it's like, is this going to be more difficult or create more opportunities? I think it'll create a lot of opportunities in the established industry. But I do think it's going to hurt kind of that industry right now where you can be found, you can be found online and then have, have your own little following. And so you're your own little niche market. Then you can do what you were saying, like, oh, you can just have a bunch of followers and I can have a career. If you do have that right now, I would be, don't count on that last thing. Like there's going to be ways that they, whether it's, oh, you have a little bit of market. I'm a big corporation. I want to, I want to buy basically your channel or your thing. Um, so, and you'll take it because you're like, Oh, I'll make millions of dollars, but then you'll be forced to do it, do things their way, you know, live the corporate life. So I think that is eventually what's going to come for independent. Um, and I think from there, you're either just going to see even more splintered niche things. Like something's going to come out of that. And you're just going to get more niche, niche, niche. But even within that thing, like look at Disney Plus, you're going to have, uh, I think, why I was talking about the Star Wars stuff. So you have your episode sequel trilogy ones. Some people love it. Some people hate it. Um, but that's exactly where I think they're learning to market it properly. Like look at the Mandalorian. I think that's a totally different audience than than the episode seven, eight, and nine crowd that they're going for. That's directly, looks like it's directly marketed for our generation and like people like us, like old school Star Wars fans. Yeah. And probably Obi-Wan too, but uh, but you'll probably start seeing more things that they'll try and market to another demographic. You're gonna see it kind of splintered off into different avenues. And I think that would be the smart way to go. Like I said, it's really hard to in this day and age, to please everybody. Even Endgame had people oh, yeah. go, people going, oh, that's not diverse enough. That's too diverse. That's that's uh, not deep enough. That's too deep. Like you're just not gonna please everybody. And I think yeah. I think there's so many more choices because there's a lot of independent people in like YouTube and that um, you'll have to do that to compete. Like you'll have to find your little niches. So I don't know what that totally means, but I think I think for me it opens up uh, hope. I used to be someone that just wanted to get into the mainstream and do the big mass mass market blockbuster, becoming from nobody to writing, producing, or whatever. <laughs> you know, mass market blockbuster is n- nigh impossible, but can I find ten thousand people in a seven billion dollar seven billion people world? that would financially support you to some degree. And I think that's that's not unrealistic. Now, I think it could be even in like a theater world. So it, it's, I guess what I was trying to say is, I think the art world needs to shift its thinking outside of get it into a movie theater, get into a massive, get on Broadway, get on this. You need to think of 
let me create something. Like, let me not create something that's going to last in culture for a thousand years. Yeah. Let me do something that excites a certain percentage of people that, you know, can support it. And if it's got mass appeal, it'll find kind of naturally it'll kind of sift its way through everything. But uh, as far as planning for the future, not writing the, the great American novel where it's on the bestseller list because people are going to stop believe, like reading what a bestseller list is. They're going to they're going to go into these like shrinking little bubbles of their own fandoms because they can tailor their whole world online to whatever they like and shape. I think that's where it's going and then you'll have AI like helping all that stuff out too. All these algorithms are just shaping your little world because based on your choices. Well, the AI thing, uh, that's an interesting conundrum because, I mean, the AI is being spearheaded by Google and Amazon. Yeah. So it's going to be designed with the intent to... And Microsoft, uh, too. To cut off our access through our web browsers. Yeah. And and only We're like, uh, come into contact with their curated yeah. uh, properties, which are going to be, of course, corporate-owned. Right. So there's still... A, there's still um, there's still a prerogative on us to seek out what we want and to kind of stick to our guns until we get it. Yeah. And to reject that that corporate messaging, which is going to become more prevalent. So it means you still got to get out of your house sometimes, and it does seem like uh, people are getting less and less likely to leave their house. Yeah. Because you don't have to go to the cinema anymore. You've got uh, all the streaming apps on your smart TV. And um, and it's so cheap. I mean, twelve ninety nine a month for all that content. Yeah, definitely beats the hell out of going down to the cinema once a week, which is pretty much what me and my buddies used to do. Yeah, cheaper than one ticket every Friday night. You know, twelve ninety nine a month is cheaper than one ticket. Twelve ninety nine a month is cheaper than one ticket to a movie. Not that's not including popcorn and parking yeah. or whatever right yeah and i can make a hell of a plate of nachos at home it'll beat the shit out of the movie theater i'll tell you that much exactly and you can pause it when you want to go to the bathroom yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah uh, i think that is ultimately where they want it to go um they want to control yeah. it so that they direct you and they are definitely doing that one of the things that i i find um that I've just surprisingly only realized now is just that I strongly suspect that a good portion of people on social media are not actual people. No, they're not bots. They're people. But they're employees of one of the, you know, five major media corporations that uh, as part of their job is to have an online persona that pushes a message towards these people. So it's just one extra avenue of, uh, a lot of people call them shills, but I think they're designed specifically only to talk about positively about this stuff. They know it and they know that, that whatever percentage they have of that buzz, they can still analyze and say, okay, the buzz is actually really low. So let's, Whenever you're seeing something overhyped with that uh, that cringeworthy, like, this is amazing, when it's clearly something like, is it amazing or is it okay? And just like certain words. And there's actually, I watched someone and like, uh, I can't remember what it was for, but there was literally like two pages, like two big screens worth of the exact same message, like copy pasted to different user accounts from Twitter saying it's literally copied and pasted the same message on different threads from different people. And it's like, if you don't think that companies are doing that, uh, and I didn't really think about it, but that's going to be kind of, it's so obvious once you start thinking about it, you're like, yeah. And I think once people start seeing the game played that way, they're going to be like, 
Oh, if you make things so intos, why can't I say that? Non authentic, inauthentic, non authentic, mm. online, uh, people are going to find different ways to get their authentic stories and interactions, right? Like, um, one of the downsides for them is that if you create a AI and or you have people doing that stuff, it's going to push people away into something else. So it's actually going to work short time, but not long, long term for them. So I'm seeing that. But it's also one of the reasons why I say that is because I know people boost their own social media by doing that. So how, like, mm -hmm. I'm going to create another account to, to like my account. I'm going to create 10 of them to boost up this account so it looks like I have more interactions to bust the algorithm. So if anybody's claiming that I'm wearing a tinfoil hat with that, if normal people are doing that, a company that has billions and billions of dollars are most certainly doing something similar. Not saying everyone who's positive about certain things are, are that, but there's definitely a percentage of that. And so now I'm looking at social media as even more of a like, oh, am I really talking to a legitimate, is this person's legitimate feelings or is this just whatever? You know, I'm not going to listen to this because it's just regurgitated stuff for pro corporation. So I think it's, I think that is um, something that is, can be exploited as a, as, as an artist that is looking to break away from the tradition um, because all you have to do is be more authentic. Eventually mm -hmm. people are going to start gravitating towards people who are like, Oh, I'm a real person, a nice person. Uh, it's not yelling and screaming. Now the downside is that is the algorithms are not, ba you're not, you're not designed to help authenticity. So I don't know how to get so around to see a trend and group together things that are similar and literally exposed um algorithm has been exposed for like facebook and twitter um to promote angry like the angrier you are about something the more exposure i guess the more oh like it'll start you know these people are interacting with this angry stuff and so that's why you see a whole bunch of why why everybody looks at him like oh it's so negative on here it's because that's what the algorithm promotes and uh you know it's what normal people kind of don't want to see so they tune out and then it gets worse because you only get the angry people that are just like nobody is angry all the time they're doing it because yeah. they're everyone on there wants to be famous and get more followers so they're they're seeing right. they're all playing the game that's what i don't like about social media now it's like look i just want to make art and i'll put my art out there and i'm fairly legitimate and i'm nice here's my art I don't make any comments about anything else. Here's my art. Do you like it? And it'll be like tumbleweeds. And then I'll see someone that's, you know, looks like they're first picked up a crayon and be like, oh, this is amazing. Like, I love the way you did this crayon color. <laughs> You're like, what? And then you go read their stuff and there's a whole bunch of, like, it's either like a super niche market of like, furry cartoons or um, mm -hmm. they're into like a certain a certain market where there's already a huge fan base within that people maybe you would never hear about them but there's like 300,000 people that love this stuff and then there's in this little loop that you would never see unless you just happened across one post and you're like oh let me go down a rabbit whoa I don't whoa this is <laughs> this is weird and I think I don't think you'll ever get rid of that in the internet, as long as the internet, even on a similar level of what it is now, like if it was totally closed, maybe. But I think you'll always have people who can hack into it and find ways around it. It's too open for, for that. But yeah, I don't think you'll get away from that. But right now, that's that's. I'm realizing how much the game is being rigged against my naivety about like oh i'll just put my stuff out there and see if people like it and how much of it's being mm. being played whether it's by people like i said corporations or by people going oh well this is what the algorithm is telling me so this is what i'm gonna do 
or like YouTube, it's like kids watch it and kids drive the algorithm because kids rewatch videos over and over and over again. Whereas adults will watch it once and we'll move on. And so everybody starts gearing their stuff to more like more kids, things that kids will watch because that's what the algorithm is telling them. They may not even be realizing it, but they're like, well, that it, it seems to do better if I do all these cra this crazy antics and stuff on to say it in and you just get a repetition of content that's being played over and over again. So it's that that's one thing that you need to like identify but also like whenever whenever you're criticizing something there's an opportunity there to take an advantage of a of a market that's not being uh that's not being tapped because whenever you have those things there's a void right there's a void that's there and it's an opportunity and it's about finding that opportunity to get in there and be like oh so one one of the reasons is like you want to you want to like discover what's going on okay they're playing the game and not just get mad and like stomp your feet and go home uh you can either try and play the game or you can figure out what the void is left and take advantage of that i think like star wars was a perfect example of that the original star wars there was a big void of something that only george lucas kind of saw made that movie boom brand new market was built out of movies the blockbuster was kind of solidified right so i don't know the answer to how to get that but i'm i'm searching for that now yeah uh and i think there i think it could go to theater writing acting acting especially like uh, i think we were discussing it before uh, you're like you're relying so much on other people. There's so many more opportunities if you're willing to not do the traditional. Think about it in a traditional way, like doing YouTube videos, doing short films that are just on YouTube. Whereas you talked to me ten years ago, I'd been like, "Screw you, that's small time. I don't want to do small time. Right. Yeah, I might do it once for exposure, but you know, it's not my career. But why? Like, why just be an actor? Why not be?" you know create your own show and act in it and like we just have to i think my main point out of all this rambling is um deconstruct our old vision of what an artist used to be and i struggle with that all the time right. do i want to be just an artist or do i want to be writer artist create videos da, 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 find ways to just like have a have an audience and that's the important part so it's something that i'm trying to work through in my own brain as well yeah i think uh one uh, this is going way back into this conversation yeah like several minutes ago um something you said about uh sort of the corporatization of the arts um and the artist's place in that i think um artists as freelancers as is the way it's been yeah. for quite a few decades now yeah so you've got you've got the artists who are off in their homes in their studios practicing their craft honing their skills getting better and better and the the corporate jobs are there yeah but they're generally short term and uh and they might be lucrative temporarily for the artists but they're definitely rigged in favor of the corporation yes. because corporations want to own stuff yeah right they're not interested in incubating an artist and yeah, know. uh you know improving them they want to get everything they can out of that person in the short term which benefits them financially in perpetuity so that they yeah. can own it like if you look at you know, like Jack Kirby's relationship with Marvel or, yeah. or something like that, yeah. right? So, like, those contracts were work for hire. Kirby knew it. He was able to feed and clothe and put a roof over the head yeah. of his family uh, for 60 years or yeah. whatever. And then when he retired, there was still a pool of money yeah. that, that came to his family and whatnot. But, but that money is only a drop in the ocean compared to, you know, what the various... Um, owners of the intellectual properties yeah. that have been divvied up 
yeah, among all, all kinds of studios. You know, all the merchandising, um, all the... that they're like that money just uh, it just multiplies on top of itself. Yeah, especially as new media are invented and they find, you know, the next new way to exploit the, the intellectual property, exploit the old drawing, the font, whatever it is that you know people are creating and. And that stuff is, it's ephemeral in a sense because time can cause uh, these trends to come and go. Yeah. But it's permanent in a corporate sense because when it inevitably comes back into popularity because another graphic designer finds an old font and digs it out and dusts it off and uses it, you know, you, you've got this corporate corporate structure that owns it and administers it and manages to collect royalties and all that. So, I mean, that's the paradigm that's sitting there. And so this idea of a niche market for independent artists is uh, is a challenge. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got to get out there and, and try to uh, circumvent the corporate structure if you want to get 100% of your dues for your work. I mean, even artists who put stuff they put paintings in art galleries and we are like, if you've ever been yeah. into an art gallery, you look and you often go, you know, $8,000 for that. It's, you know, it's just a canvas and some paint. Yeah. I could have done that, which of course is not true because you need to put in your 20 years worth of yeah. training to become the artist, but not just that, but you know, sometimes as much as 50, 70% of that, ticket price is going to the studio just for the yeah for the benefit of hosting it yep. and that money wouldn't be on the table for the artist if if that wasn't there right but now with um you know you can with instagram artists taking commissions you can do portraits on people's profile pictures you can take commissions on existing ip which is you know dodgy yeah. legally but it does happen yeah and so, you know, that's one possible niche market for visual artists. And then there's other things happening for musicians. And I think taking commissions, you know, is more the root. Yeah. Which has always been there. And it's still a freelance paradigm. And then the other side of that is like I was saying about the publishing, which is to own your own material. Yes. And, you know, um, whether it, whether it takes off or whether it bombs is completely your responsibility and it, it's always your um, it's always down to you you know to to create a new piece today or tomorrow if if you want to yeah and see how that goes well you brought up something interesting that just uh, gave me a thought um, and if it's something that uh, as an artist you create an IP uh, like a Jack Kirby type thing, but like let's say, for example, my graphic novel. You know, it's been traditionally, and this is, I guess, you're helping me illustrate what I mean by the traditional model in people's head. So I'm creating this comic. Um, let's say I have my little audience that's I'm able to live for the next little bit. Like the audience doesn't seem to be going away, so I can live in moderation off of what I'm doing here take commissions uh, uh, just off sales of this book and hopefully grow it a little bit by you know maybe I'll do a second book and see if my audience can grow slowly but I'm you know it's modest I won't be able to maybe retire off it maybe someday I would um, but the kind of traditional thought is oh but if I sell it you know if, if I sell the movie rights boom I'm, I'm rich and Yes, you could be, but then you also lose, uh, you know, like you said, corporations want to own it, right? You might get like a little small percentage or something, you work that out. But uh, because people still believe in that old traditional thing, we haven't segued into a fully niche market mindset, is that you're under no, like, you're under no... Uh, obligation to accept that old traditional model if a company wants to buy your IP you don't have to give it all over to them and now is the best time to do this hard 
negotiation. If you have an audience that's supporting you and you're like, yeah, I'm living pretty well. I could, as long as I don't screw stuff up, I could, you know, next 10, 20 years, if I could keep growing this audience, I could make a little bit more money and I'll be, I'll be fine. Uh, well, you have a corporation coming in here and we're like, we'll give you like $4 million for this, but you have to, you're like, we're going to own everything. You're un under no obligation now to say, okay to those terms you can go no you don't you can lease this stuff out to me but if you make any merchandise i want you know kind of like the lucas model did with with fox he did a brilliant move you can do that if they can also say you know go screw yourself but if they're willing to offer you millions of dollars for something don't take the money and run away and be like ha ha, ha. you know you don't have to do that you can you know, that's up to you but then you know you've lost the right to like kind of make your own merchandise and stuff but what you're seeing now is you're seeing people that you uh who do do that like youtubers and instagram people uh and where i'm i'm coming at it from is this this niche market growing is that you're seeing kids see these people do this and the next generation is going to perfect it more and mm. there's going to be the battle between the corporations running the algorithms and to that but the younger generation always finds ways around that and that's what you have to kind of anticipate uh like if you're already in this world or trying to make it in this world before the next generation kind of comes and turns it over on its head you kind of have to anticipate where it might be going so then you can take advantage of it that's kind of where i'm coming from is that if you do happen to get that deal like you can still want to get the big payout, but you don't have to accept all the terms. And I think traditionally before it was just like, yes, finally, like this is what I'm doing it for. I'm doing it to sell. And that's what I was doing. I'm going to write a book. So hopefully one day I'll sell the movie rights to it and make big money. And, you know, like have them totally destroy the story in their own stupid version of <laughs> the movie. Well, no, you could say, I want creative control over that and they have every right to say no but you all have every right to say no and it's it's just much easier now if you do have an audience already that's already backing you to be like well i don't need these millions of dollars and if you like it then another company might come in here and, and agree to my terms or we negotiate certain terms so uh if you are worried about giving away your ip you don't have to I don't think you have to. I think I think um, to bring it kind of full circle with all of these competing new avenues of content that they're going to have to fill content into. You know, it's not TV anymore. You don't just buy your TV because that's something you do. No, you're subscribing directly to a provider now of content, and that person's going to need content and content and content. So eventually, they're going to have to start coming to people like me and you who create things and go hey we like your stuff we want to buy it and it's up to the newer generation and these and people like you and i to be like you can rent it basically you can license it so there is going to be an opportunity there i think if people just can use their own their own uh, audience uh leverage against big corporations and like you won't own this in perpetuity like you can license this for 10 yep. years. And then if this contract runs out, you can relook at if you want to renew it. Or So I think there is opportunities to go from that. And I think building a niche market is going to benefit you long term for that because they're going to be looking for whatever markets they can tap because they're not going to see it. But people are like alternate reality games. They like, they like so many different mm -hmm. things that a company probably doesn't even have any clue exists but are super popular with niche markets. Uh, yeah, I guess the question is just um, what's it going to be, essentially, because I think uh, we obviously saw uh, iTunes and, and YouTube and, and Amazon and, uh, and for a little while Netflix serving a, a purpose as a good destination for independent work. Yeah. Um, all of those have been either bought by Google or Facebook now or gone extremely uh, proprietary on their own. Right. So I think 
uh, it's a wait for for new platforms to emerge, uh, which give us our, our ownership back, yeah. the material that we post on it, or that those already exist and that uh, like even you and I don't are yeah. on the internet all the time haven't even spotted them yet. But, yeah. I mean, you know, there's something waiting to step into that void if that void exists. And um, and uh, as an artist, uh, how do you find it? How do you get signed up to it? And then how do you start collecting money for yeah. the work that you do? And, um, you know, again, going back to that whole, like, freelancer corporate thing, I mean, I don't think... Nobody really takes up an art form to become a corporate artist. Exactly. Really. And so um, so then, you know, it, there's like a philosophy or an aesthetic to what your motives are in doing the work. And, it, you know, it's got to be A, to improve. Yeah. You know, keep honing your skills and perfecting your craft. And then, and then the B is to uh, try to make a living at it. Yeah, so the reality is that it's still pretty much a pipe dream to be able to make a full-time living as an artist. But, uh, you know, with more platforms popping up and more ingenuity from the artists themselves, that becomes probably more of a, a reality, more uh, of, a, of a possibility. I would say a pipe dream to maybe make a living for the rest of your life or like I said if you're thinking more traditionally so like there's a lot of artists that you know I discovered through YouTube that I would follow their tutorials or whatever and again they go through like patreon and they're basically making their own living off of that but then they you know that part of that is teaching and then part of then I'll do teacher stuff like I know you do a lot of like yeah. teaching as well it's yep. incorporating and I guess that's what I meant about getting rid of the old model in your head incorporating that new model it's not just it's not just the art anymore i mean if you want it to be then you know traditional methods still apply but then you're relying 100 percent on your work better be the best and you better have like good luck right and the way we're doing it still has luck. Like you need to have the luck to be able to find an audience. Like that audience still has to see you and pass it on and da 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 da. But you can build a relatively small audience that could basically pay for your stuff. But you have to cross platform. You have to have like a right. YouTube channel. It's like what I'm trying to do. You have to have social media presence. You have to do. In many ways, it's very corporate like. Like you're going to have to do stuff that you don't want to do because your audience you know is supporting you and they want certain things but that's the nature of just doing business i think i don't think there's an artist out there like if you're a visual artist a painter has ever not like they used to get commissioned too right we want you to paint the sistine's chapel do you think yeah. that was his biggest dream was to paint the Sistine? he probably wanted to paint uh birds that was his big dream. I just want to sit here and paint birds. And now you're going to ask me to paint the Sixteen Chapel. Okay, well, it's a great opportunity. I'm going to go paint the Sistine. You know, like, artists traditionally always have to paint stuff that they don't necessarily want to do. It's part of the process, right? <laughs> um, the difference is, is that you're answering directly to a consumer instead of a suit telling you what the what he thinks the, he or she think the consumer wants and and that's where it can get soul crushing like uh, you're totally off but uh, you sign the checks yeah definitely in that era you know um the church was the corporation yeah <laughs> in those days so yeah i don't know if uh you know if the master felt like he was sacrificing some of his integrity to go in and paint the Sistine chapel <laughs> Some of the Sistine Chapel is pretty subversive. Yeah. Um, but I, I definitely think the master might have been disappointed if he missed out on the Sistine Chapel to do the new Pepsi logo. I think that would have definitely <laughs> been soul crushing, but probably much more lucrative. You would have died with a lot more money in yeah. your pocket. 
Uh, yeah, I'm definitely not saying that he resented doing it. I'm just saying that he probably yeah. never thought of doing it until he was commissioned to do it. It probably wasn't him going, right. my biggest dream is to paint the roof of a church. Like, as an artist, yeah. you're not going to be thinking about that. Like, It's like, oh, uh, my Patreon supporter wants me to draw a portrait of his pet dog. Well, mm -hmm. that isn't my dream to paint a portrait of his pet dog. I can still enjoy that process. Um, the difference yeah, is, uh, where I was alluding to, is that the difference is that, um, you know, that person is... is paying you to do something and that's a specific person you can like take enjoyment out of creating something for that person or for these pe a direct audience so you can take joy in something that maybe uh you're doing stuff that you wouldn't do if you if you like what i mean about doing something you don't necessarily want to do it's like what i would draw in my free time just for me would be different than what i would draw for for people that are asking me something right like oh well i'm taking time to do this for something um, that's yeah. just the job. But if it's a corporation specifically telling you to change your story because um, then you're like, uh, that's different. That's a, yeah. that's a person telling you how to talk to your own audience because of different reasons. And that's where it gets yeah. soul crushing. That's when... It needs more... Get... Uh, yeah. <laughs> this story about... Uh about drug dealers needs more fuzzy animals and trucks <laughs> exactly. Exactly. because our research says that that sells the most yeah, toys that's what people like <laughs> exactly <Yeah. laughs> uh, all right okay well let's rewrite the scene <laughs> yeah avia rod model of filmmaking yeah. <laughs> exactly um no i i, I think uh, i'm kind of to we're at about an hour here so i should wrap it up and we won't go two hours like last week uh, I think okay. when I think about this stuff, I get inspired because um, you think of things like I was just watching a video on the Blair Witch Project and remembering how all that went down and how that was the news. Yeah. Like, there's so many, I think we talked loosely about this stuff. You could do so many different things. It's just getting out of that traditional mindset of how to tell a story. Um, like I had mm -hmm. an idea of, of doing my graphic novel, but maybe not even selling it as a graphic novel either doing it multiple like sell the graphic novel show it on like a free web comic and but i may only show it on like youtube or at least for the first bit like as a video of my graphic novel it's, it's just getting outside of the tradition of uh i make something i sell it and it like he, there's many different ways you can go about things now and i think it's an exciting time if you think about it the right way um of not being a traditional artist because again i think i mentioned this last week too i could be wrong but we're going to be competing with robots soon so you got to find ways yeah to uh to go past what the people program programming the ai is going to see what an artist is so you're gonna to have to be inventive if you want to stay relevant then. yeah i don't think there's too much to worry about i you know these blurry faced uh pixelized uh portraits <laughs> <laughs> that probably is the definition of a niche market well if someone wants this digitized portrait but someone who's truly an art appreciator is not gonna have the time of day no but like that kind of thing but so the fear, you, I guess, is not being able to recognize the difference. Yeah, so you're eventually. thinking of, like, you know, again, it's kind of the traditional thing. Like, oh, I make art, I go to an art dealer, and I sell it for millions of dollars. But it's people like me who yeah. are, are trying to get normal people that are into, like, art and comics. They're like, I like that, so I want to buy your books and stuff. Um, so you're trying to yeah. appeal to, like, a, oh, I like that. Oh, maybe I'd commission $40. But you already have apps that make... Uh, I'll take a picture of myself and I make it look like it's a painting or a drawing or whatever. And they're getting right. pretty good. That's just right now, right? Yeah. And I see other artists on like Instagram and stuff, and they'll make they'll like do a full painting, but you're like, you know how easy it is to trace and just airbrush stuff, and and so there are people that trace and pretend it's a painting, 
Um, so that's one thing, you're having people do that. Or if you have people doing that, it's going to be really easy just to have an AI robot do that and have a corporation be like, hey, look at this painting. And if people are liking it already, then that takes away people like, okay, well, why am I working so hard to make this look super realistic? So you're going to have to find ways to make it, which is exciting of like, it needs something to be expressive. And that's for the... Yeah. Yeah. foreseeable future AI probably won't be able to do an expressive artistic thing and I would assume that people are going to gravitate towards styles that are more expressive and human so that's kind of the thought process of like competing with AI is like you're gonna it's gonna bring a dynamic where you're going to have to think of things differently because it will in 10 years be they'll produce stuff that you're like, I, I can't tell if this was uh, an app that did this from a picture. Hopefully the day comes where I can do these podcasts by deep fake. So I can <laughs> just kind of like eat pizza or take a nap. <laughs> well, I, and so uh, we still get the product. Well, that's definitely coming too. That's yeah. kind of what I mean. Like for it's going to touch everything. Like, yeah, maybe it's 20 years from now and maybe it's not 10, but the way things move, fast and ai is moving really fast that people don't realize like it's it's driving cars <laughs> and it's going to change a bunch of industries in the next but probably earliest is five years and uh you know art and that kind of thing is not far behind in that and if a movie studio like disney can like what you're seeing with the like the live action remakes you know you got just announced lady and the tramp too where it's like cg but there's some real stuff in there that's a test mm -hmm. you know that this is a that's a stepping stone to well once a once we have ai that can render a 3d person and animate him we don't need all these people yeah. to animate them and guess what it's so realistic looking why do we need even actors yeah oh well the voices still don't work so we'll have voice actors come in and do it but we've got the Uncali Valley's gone. We can do this all in house, just with the, you know, we'll have one person over. We'll have a director that oversees it for now, and then he'll just he'll just make sure that everything's working. Then we only have to pay one person. It's free. <laughs> yeah, the supermarketization of uh, of filmmaking. Yeah, so you'll. It's definitely in the pipeline. It's it's definitely coming. Whether it's going to be accepted or how prevalent it'll be but i think it'll be little bits and people will either yeah people are either gonna reject i think if they don't reject it now which you are seeing a lot of kind of backlash about these hey what's with these disney remake things like too much too soon like they're doing it awfully fast too like bam 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 to a year almost and you're like whoa what's going on uh imagine if they didn't have to pay actors just took a rendering yeah. time of algorithm, like a couple computers that were like, "Hey, we can run all night and all day, animate this movie for you in the in a week." Boom! There's your content. Well, it's going to be interesting. Definitely had a fear that that was going to happen. Uh, maybe going back to like um, what was that Jude Law film that was made all on green screen? Uh, oh. Uh, tomorrow man of tomorrow captain, captain something yeah yes you want to say captain planet but that was that <laughs> environmental superhero captain anyway, and the world of well, tomorrow the first time they made a movie without any sets yeah and that was probably the beginning of the fear that um that everything human and everything practical would be completely replaced in movies uh and i just think that's not interesting enough for the artists and that's where the line's going to be drawn yeah the artists themselves will decide how they want to work and you know if it's if uh robert rodriguez wants to make a completely cgi movie with photorealistic characters in it he's got the technology to do it now yeah but robert rodriguez also produces pro wrestling <laughs> so i mean he loves live entertainment and music and rock bands and as much as he loves cgi movies yeah. and that's 
kind of what makes him like a real artist with lots of curiosity about all kinds of different mediums, all kinds of different places. So, I mean, that, that's the vanguard is the artist has to protect, you know, the, the integrity of the material that's being put out there. There's nothing wrong with a photograph, but it's, it's not a real person, but also some real people are assholes. And you yeah. <laughs> get along a lot better with the still photograph. So I mean, yeah. that's just reality. Well, that's where I, um, I, I'm going to with this thought process. You just kind of illustrated it re- yeah. really well for me. Is that that's what I mean about like having your niche where you're going to be going. Artists are going to have to yeah. be like, okay, I'm being replaced. It's going to be in every industry, really. You're going to find automation in a lot of different industries. Like if you can automate... Uh, making a movie then why would a corporation even want to pay R- Rodriguez any money they wouldn't they don't care well, I, I, right. I don't need this I don't need to pay you any money I'll make a billion dollars and I didn't it, did, it cost me nothing because I already have these computers that can do this if they can get away with it they would do it right um, so the artist wouldn't have any say in that if the artist does have a say in that is that you've got to take the model now and it has to grow as an artistic community and that's where I'm kind of going with this is that you've got to have create niche markets and and embrace that it's a niche market in order to survive in a changing world and say I don't that traditional thing is going to be gone soon I might as well already think it's gone and just start right like forging my own road there's a few other people that are already doing it but to start doing it now start doing it now and accept that Oh, it's not a traditional way of doing things. It's just, it's changing, and change doesn't mean uh, doesn't always mean every the sky is falling. The sky may be falling for mm-hmm. you in that direction, but you can go in this direction, and it's a bit better. And there's a whole bunch of other directions. So I think I think in my hopeful mindset is that people like Rodriguez and that auteurs and art, artists that actually like like their craft and aren't just doing it for a corporate gig are going to do their own thing. And like you said, he's got all these other interests that he can he can do if he wants to do that instead. And he's like, oh, I don't really like the way it's going, so I'm going to focus on my music and da 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 Because you don't have to be one thing anymore, too. That's the other opening thing. You know, if I do art, well, does that mean I can't write a book? No, I can write a book now. Does that mean I can't do my own movies as well or act? Or, you know, you can do all of that stuff. So I think... I think the way to go to kind of create a little bit of safety for you in the future in a changing market is number one, build some sort of audience for yourself if you can. Create your own little yeah. niche. Create a niche. Don't be afraid of being. Uh, yeah, I guess the point of this whole podcast was being niche used to be a bad word. Uh, uh, it's, yeah, it's too niche. I want to be. Right. I kind of want to be pop. Like I want to be popular. I want to be some niche, make some like cult classic movie. I want. I want. I want to be Star Wars. I want to be big time. And I think now niche has to be not a dirty word, whether it is or not. But for us, it used to be kind of a. Eh. So you make comics, huh? That was like a niche, right? Yeah. Mm. Indie music. Mm, you're not a real yeah. writer. You're not a real just artist. Filmmakers that were, you know, making German expressionist black and white, whatever in the '90s. I mean, it was sneered at by the mainstream, and but now, um, you know, those types of artists have continued to develop their craft, and and in many cases have gone mainstream. Not necessarily even by an intention to do so, but yeah. just by being consistent with their work and and getting uh, a following, exactly the way you described. Yeah, I just think how freeing it is to like, if you if you have a following, you just release stuff to a fan base that's accepting of you, and you're gonna get yeah. a direct response like that. Oh, that wasn't as quality as I know you could be. Great. Okay. Well, I'll, we'll work harder <laughs> for the next one. Yeah. I'm not told, but. Well, our market research, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I think it's yeah, it's it's not it's uh, I guess people 
are so fame hungry that I, I fear that there's going to be a lot of people and artists that are still like, oh, I want to be well known. And it's like, you got to embrace the fact that you could have an audience of 20,000 people, but you know, your direct family and your normal friends are still going to wonder like what you draw. So you draw pictures and how do you make a living off that? Like that it's going to seem niche and they, they won't know. And you have to embrace that. That's great. If I could make a good living and have yeah. no one recognize me or know who I am, awesome. I have some fans. If I go to a specific place like a Comic Con or a meetup, they all know who I am and they like my work, awesome. But if everyone else knows and I can remain relatively anonymous, perfect. I can go to the store and not be bugged. I don't want to be famous. Yeah. I, I want. You don't want to be trolled yeah, either. I want my work maybe to be somewhat yeah. famous, but I don't. It's not about me. So it's about embracing that as a, like a culture of an artist. Like, oh yeah, well, it's not about my name anymore. It's about my work. Or yeah, letting the work speak for itself. All right, I think or collecting that's... the profits when they come. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right, I think that's a good time to end that. We're at about an hour, just over an hour here. Yeah, just uh, just good luck, everybody, especially those listening who are artists themselves uh just keep chasing the dream and um, don't forget what made you love what you do in the first place and um and please if you're listening send your comments and uh, suggestions to the podcast uh or you can send them to, directly to me on uh, twitter and instagram at the famous jmc awesome uh or, or you can send it to me as well at old ken studios on Twitter, um, or you can just leave a comment in the YouTube um, section if you're watching this, uh, and either one of us will get it. Uh, but yeah, we would love to hear your feedback. Uh, but for now, I think that's going to be it. Um, talk to you next time. Peace.